Welcome to the One Hero Podcast, where we answer Malaysians' burning questions about personal finance with fact-based answers. In 1965, Warren Buffett bought a small and failing textile company called Berkshire Hathaway. Almost six decades later, he turned this humble company into a multi-billion dollar conglomerate with holdings of some of the largest companies in the world, such as Apple, Coca-Cola, and Amex. Who is Warren Buffett? What can you learn from his decades of investing? And why are hundreds of thousands of people flocking to the AGM of Berkshire Hathaway every year? Welcome back to the One Hero podcast. In today's episode, we talk about the Oracle of Omaha. What makes Berkshire Hathaway one of the most valuable companies in the world today? And how can you apply Buffett's principles to your own investing journey? So John, what first drew you to Warren Buffett? I think it's his wealth. <laughs> I'll just be very, very honest. So yeah, <laughs> um, actually uh, way back in 2005, um, uh, I was uh, doing my master's. I was doing my postgraduate in University of Technology in Malaysia. And I was prepping for job interviews. And one of the things uh, in my past time I love to read is actually the Forbes uh, richest list. So the reason why I even get a, a whole of a copy of the Forbes magazine is because the UTM library has them. It's very expensive, you know, Louis. If you buy yeah. them off the shelf, one copy is about 20 ringgit. It's like a book. But mm. it's actually produced monthly, right? Yes. And uh, way back in 2005, he was always in the top 10 richest list next to names like Bill Gates. <clears throat> that time, like today, the richest man in the world is um, the LVMH owner, right? Bernard Arnault. 2005 was no way to be seen. Bernard Arnault. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, the current owner of uh, SoftBank, Masayoshi Sun. At one point of time, he was the richest man in the world. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, but now nowhere to be seen, also, mm. right? <laughs> so, so uh, it's always been um, an interesting read, curious read for me about about the richest people. So when I saw the brief excerpt that like explained how did Buffett actually attain his riches, uh, it was very unique. It was investing. I'm like, hey, I thought most people up there excuse me was usually an, a business owner like bill gates he owns microsoft right so rewind back maybe six seven years before that um i was very lucky someone introduced to me uh the book by robert kiyosaki rich that poor that and prior to that um when i was uh doing uh what i call it part-time work internship when i had some money i always thought about trying to go into properties first because that's how i got introduced in the world of finance but when i got to know buffett more and more uh, over the years i realized that equities return the best returns as an asset class and after dabbling my hands into property when i first started working in, in shell 2006 2007 Whereas, wow, property was not my cup of tea. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so like, um, were you actually, like, keeping money to buy your first property already at that time? Yeah, I was already keeping money. And I think I, if I did not mention it in the, the podcast uh, we talked about uh, prior to this, I actually lost my first 25,000 ringgit in the stock market speculating. Because oh, at yeah. that point, I yeah, I knew about Warren Buffett, but I did not practice his principles, and I was just went in and 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 um just gambled it away. I put it this way. I didn't know what I was doing, and mm -hmm. it was all just based on tips, hearsay, and all that kind of thing. And I think that was what ins inspired me more and more about Warren Buffett. Because as I got to read more of his books, and I was very lucky, someone introduced me. Peter Lynch, and when I read Peter Lynch, I said, hey, he, he talks about Buffett as well, Buffett's principles. I was like, wow, this guy is everywhere, man. <laughs> All the managers that you talk about, people just refer to Buffett, Buffett, Buffett. So I'm like, what's so, what, what's so great about him? You know, yes, he's, he's very rich. Then when you start reading his books, his letters, ah, that's where he has a very, what um, in American, there's this term called folk C. I don't know if you heard of this term before, Louis. Uh, not not really no okay no. so like folksy is like 
um, in Asia, we will say like when you when you meet someone older and then they have like a very fatherly figure or grandfatherly oh. figure and then they'll explain to you because of years of wisdom and experience, right? They'll explain to you like in a very calm manner, in a very non-threatening manner and then he treats you like a child uh, or a or grand, grandchild, right? Um, I think that's how Americans actually sometimes describe like the very down to earth, very country. Uh, that's foxy. Lah. He does. Warren is not a guy who flashes his wealth. He explains concepts in a very concise, uh, and he likes analogies. Like you know, you say that I like analogies, right? Yeah. Buffett yeah. has like a million and one analogies. <laughs> but how about yeah. like how about like your friends, like people around you? Were they also as keen about Warren Buffett as you were? No, no. I can tell you. I mean, like out of the ten people I know. Um, I would say probably two. You'll be lucky to get three. And the guy, I mean, like I told you, my one of my earliest uh, mentors that led me into stock investing the right way, value investing. He's he's still based in Miri, actually. He's a lawyer. His name is Thompson Lee. And uh, yeah, I mean, you have to go seek out these people. Like your question is like, how many people around you? Chances are, right, I'll share with you a very interesting uh, discovery we made. So I just attended Berkshire Hathaway's AGM. And uh, when we were there at the airport, a lot of guys like see us as Asians and then they know we're not from America because we don't have that accent, right? We don't have the American accent. So they say, where are you guys from? Malaysia. What are you guys here for? Berkshire Hathaway. And they give me a blank look, you know. And then I, I, I said, Warren Buffett. They give me another blank look, you know. I'm like, uh, wow. And it's not just in the like the 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 smaller airports, you know. We're talking about we were in Dallas Fort Worth, which is one of the busiest airport hubs in the world. Okay. Uh, we were in the San Francisco airport and the customs officer also like they're like like blur, you know, the immigration officer, sorry. Yeah. So I'm like, wow, you know, it's like to us, we look at Warren Buffett like a demigod. <laughs> to most Americans, right? I'm like, who's he? <laughs> they probably know. Uh, what's that? The Kardashians. <laughs> better than, yeah, yeah, better than Warren Buffett. Lah. So that's how <clears throat> I think it's because he's very frugal, uh, very folksy, doesn't show off and all that kind of thing. Lah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so like I, I, I think like from from uh, the perspective, like personal perspective, what I also like about him as a kid when I when I okay, so first, first he's very rich, right? Okay, yeah, the mm. richest person. The second thing I really loved about uh him is that he he keeps drinking coke oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, so as a kid right, i was like why well, is he an old man drinking coke all the time right so i can drink coke <laughs> that's a good one so you tell your mom hey you know this guy yeah. and now now he lives he lives still 90 over right you can tell your mom hey yeah, you see exactly. drink coke every day he can still live to 90 something you know <laughs> yeah, that's right, correct. Mm, yeah yeah so um, the other thing what I was attracted to him about was actually his investing style, uh, Louis. So like both you and I, we've discussed about investing, um, about other personal finance concepts. But in Buffett, right, I think the way he breaks down how he invests and why he invests uh, is really what attracted me. Because... Um, a lot of people who come into the investing world, uh, they either come in through what I call a high finance route. So what, are, what do I mean by high finance? You did banking, you did uh, banking and finance in school, or you did accountancy and all that kind of thing. And they will tell you all these mathematical um, concepts. These mathematical concepts were like, oh, how do you predict the movements in the markets? How do you time the markets? How do you size the portfolio based on some math? And his style is, hey, I invest in businesses that I know. Behind every stock, there's a business. Uh, it represents a certain value. Uh, and that value is based on likely cash flows in the future. So he, he will wait for that business to trade at a discount knowing that the future cash flows he's trying to, he will try to predict what the future cash flow is but he'll buy it at a discount to the value of his future cash flows and that's how he invests and you'd be surprised a lot of these high finance guys right they, they were never taught about buffett in school okay contrary to popular belief you would think like they do they teach courses about buffett yes 
they do, but in very selected schools, Columbia Business School, uh, even Stanford, I don't think they have a dedicated course about value investing uh, in Harvard and all that kind of thing. So I think his investing style uh, attracted a lot of successful value investors today. You'd be surprised, like, there's this guy, he's French, his name is Jean-Marie Elevard. Of, uh, he, he won three years in a row, Morningstar Best Fund Manager, okay? Uh, and he didn't know about Buffett until he he moved from Paris over to somewhere, you know, to 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 manage the investment side. And he 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 chanced upon some a friend gave him Buffett's book. He read Buffett's book and said, "Oh my God!" After eight years being in finance, only then I understood what value what what investing really is, you know. So he woke up, you know. And I think he Buffett inspired tons and tons of people. Yeah, yeah. I could go on and on about you know many many investors yeah. inspired by Buffett. Yeah, but yeah, that's his style. Like Initially, you were like a, a speculator, right? You were saying Correct. basically a gambler. Yeah. So it's yeah. definitely changed your investing style, right? Yes, definitely changed my investing style. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, so after you have changed to Buffett's investing style, did you see like your wealth grow after that? Oh, definitely. I mean, like, um, there's a, there's a deck that I usually share with my potential customers uh, for, for them when I try to share with them um, my investing journey. And um, yeah, I just plotted out the years when I started going into the stock market, which was like 2007, 2008, where I lost money, 2008. Then 2009, when I was introduced value investing by Thompson. And after that, how I grew from there, and just purely just on the value investing trajectory, right? I think my most um, successful stock based on value investing principles uh, made me 11 times my money. Yeah. Wow, 11 times. Yeah, Malaysian okay. stock somehow. Huh? Whoa, wow. Malaysian stock. When, what, wait, what period was that? Uh, I bought it in 2018. And then uh, it made me 11 times in 2021, I think. 2021, oh. yeah, 2021, yeah, yeah, by mm -hmm. 2021. Okay. Um, the, overseas, the one that made me uh, six, six close to seven times my money was actually something that is actually something that all of us use, actually. It's uh, MasterCard. Oh, MasterCard, okay. Yeah, purely value investing principles, understand mm -hmm. the business understand it well, buy it at a cheap valuation. I didn't, that time I didn't really buy it at cheap, but I bought it like a reasonable valuation. Monish Prabhai, until today, one of the investors that I've met in Omaha, he never bought MasterCard. His best friend, uh, Guy Spire, who also runs a, a hedge fund, bought MasterCard, he's his biggest position in his portfolio. And then he will always catch out Monish. Hey, when are you going to load up MasterCard? And Monish oh. will always say it's too expensive. <laughs> so Monish missed out on the 7x or probably 8x of MasterCard because <laughs> it was too expensive. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think I think that can be said for a, a, a lot of stocks. I think you will definitely miss out on some. That oh, you like, know. you know, NVIDIA, I missed out on it. It was like too expensive, okay? So, but again, you can't catch all the fish in the yeah, world. You can't, so. you can't. <laughs> Yeah, you can't even yeah. even the best investor. I think Warren Buffett also like for a long time didn't buy Apple, right? He didn't buy Apple. He didn't. He also regretted not buying Amazon because he couldn't understand it. Yeah, yeah, mm. and he missed out. Yeah. And he said Bezos was a fantastic executor of the business. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think also like with value investing, you also have to think about the the long long term, right? Rather Correct. than like, in your speculative method, it was more of like okay, like how much can I gain quickly, you know. And that's actually how you lose a lot of money as well. Oh, so, yes, okay. yes. Yeah. So so maybe we, we also like if if you could share some interesting things about Warren Buffett, right? So I I know he likes to drink a lot of coke, right? <laughs> but what other interesting things uh if someone does not know about Buffett, will you will you tell them about him? Very good. So uh it's actually so many documentaries have been made about him and um, you know about how he used to uh, sell newspapers in the freezing morning, throw newspapers, make money, how he would use to buy uh, 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 slot machines and then you, you know he actually made business from his children. From his children? He, he oh. would install a slot machine 
mm-hmm. in his house and then he will make sure that the kids play and then lose money on it <laughs> oh my okay. gosh yeah, yeah 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 but it's to teach them concepts about probability yeah uh so here's one trivia that i think some may know some may not know so there's there's three numbers i'm going to give you two 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 dollar sixty one two dollar ninety five and three dollar seventeen what do you think those three numbers mean uh? so three numbers two dollars sixty one cents two dollars and ninety five cents and three dollars seventeen cents no idea no idea so that is the amount of money <clears throat> that he will ask his wife uh so he, he would drive he would drive to work it's a five minutes drive to work that's the amount of money he will ask his wife to put inside the dashboard for him to buy his mcdonald's breakfast so besides coke he eats mcdonald's every day for breakfast so how 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 he decides on buying whether it's a 261 breakfast or 295 or 317 it depends on how uh the market is for the day if the market is good he will spend three dollars 17 cents if the market is bad he will spend 261 so it's a difference of about 50 cents uh. yeah 50 cents and that is what the amount that he would get his wife to put in the dashboard for him to buy the McDonald's drive through to work. So even for him, he has his down days and he's ha- he has his up days. Uh, and how he decides to splurge is a difference of 50 cents. Uh. So <laughs> why I wanted to showcase that is, can you imagine how frugal, you know, most of us, we celebrate, oh, we're talking about Wagyu A5, you know, or this one. This one, he makes a difference between a 261 McDonald's breakfast or a $3.17 McDonald's breakfast to celebrate. Is, is he still like that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do today. Yes. <laughs> and um, even better, because of the, uh, he stays in a very, uh, I would say, normal neighborhood, Louis. Um, you wouldn't be able to distinguish his house uh, from other people. And um, if you go on the day of the AGM, uh, or, or um, what do you call it, you go on the day of the AGM or, or close to it, uh, because too many people just want to visit his house, there's actually a lot of CCTVs and securities. This is a private property. Please get off the lawn. <laughs> but I went like three days before the AGM. We could snap photos all we want right in front of the house. Yeah, yeah. Did he, did he charge for that? I mean, when I read the letter, that he wrote um he said like during the agm maybe last year's agm he's like oh you know like everyone bought like this much four hundred thousand something worth of seas candy yes yes yeah no yeah. So, so I, <laughs> that's interesting yeah yeah i, I think, think if I, you charge oh. right if you charge uh, i think wow i tell you uh, uh there will be a long queue <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just already become some kind of character that you know people want to visit his house, you know. Correct, correct. We see how he actually lives, things like that, right? Rather yes. than just like yeah, even better is not just the house that he currently lives. Uh it's more about uh some of them. I've I joined an Airbnb tour and we actually went to where he was actually born, the house where he was born. Yeah. And oh, it's a oh, it's okay. like a I think the equivalent will I would say it looks like a, you know how it looks like or not? It looks like a JKR quarters. You know JKR quarters in Miri? Mm-mm. It's on stilts. It's actually a little bit on stilts. And it's like oh. a one or two bedroom apartment. Very, very small. Um, mm. I think I'm looking at it. I'm just just making an assumption. Uh, it's probably about three to four hundred square feet, somewhere there. It's not it's not a very big house. Yeah, yeah. Mm-mm-mm. I think he still he still maintains like not doing and uh, like buying anything fancy for himself. Uh, there now. is there is uh which is his jet lah, but <laughs> <laughs> but that is more for business purpose. His cars, mm-hmm. right? You know how he buys, yeah. You know how he buys his cars, or not Louis. So in the US, there's this thing called a hailstorm. I don't know if you know what's a hail. Hailstorm is like yeah, yeah the uh, the ice break. Correct, correct, correct. So most cars, if it's been through a hailstorm, there's a lot of kings, a lot of dings on the car. 
he will actually go to a garage sale where the car has been battered by a hailstorm. Uh, obviously, they will refurbish the car and everything, but he will buy it because it's, it's bloody cheap. Because after a hailstorm, even though the car is brand new, there's a lot of dings. So it's not perfect. Ah. So he'll buy cars like that. And um, yeah, it's even, even at his wealth, right, he will still do that. And what I heard most recently is that uh, because he's getting older, his uh, what hand-eye coordination is not that good. He actually rear-ended someone. I mean, he's crushed some in, into someone's back. And then because of that, then he needs to get someone to drive him to work already rather than, you know. Oh, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, so, like, uh, yeah, like, exactly. <clears throat> All this while, he's always been driving on his own. Yeah. He's like a value investor, whether it comes to like companies or his life, right? Correct, so, correct. Mm -hmm. So when his wife, there was one, one joke uh, that his wife bought curtains. And then yeah. his, he, uh, he actually said to the wife, Susie, he said, why are you wasting money on $2 billion curtains? So the wife looked at him and was like, $2 billion curtains? What do you mean? Yeah, it's actually um, compounding. Because the, the curtains may cost like 1,000, 2,000 US dollars now, but you compound over 40 years, it can actually be in the billions. Uh. That's what he meant. Uh. He's trying to make it to the extreme, uh, Louis. Mm -mm, because he thinks in a very, very long term, I think. So yeah. another thing I also heard is that he's, he's planning not to give his wealth to his kids. Uh, he gave some of it, very little. Uh, and even Susie Jr., which is his eldest daughter. Um, I don't know if you read about the story where Susie wanted a 30,000 loan from Buffett to renovate no. his house. Yeah. Renovate uh, his house? Her house. Sorry, her, her house. house. Guess what was the answer from Buffett? No. No, correct. Oh my God, why? Because he wanted his children to grow up on its own and not just craving for his wealth. So one of his children is a successful farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, Susie manages the the eldest daughter manages the philanthropy for 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 Buffett, and then um, the other <clears throat> the middle the middle child um, is an accomplished musician. So none of the three children are actually into the investing world, and he just let them be with interest. Obviously, he guided them when he was younger, when they were younger, but. Um, yeah, none of these children actually picked up investing and he doesn't want them to live off the wealth and thinking like they're entitled to it. Actually, that's the whole reason why he gave all his money away from charity. And it's lucky that he still got the daughter to actually manage the philanthropic efforts because it's so much money. Actually, giving money away is also a full-time job, you know. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty interesting that you brought up the point that he doesn't want to inherit. Um, he's donated like over... He's pledged all his wealth to be given away, like ev almost everything. And the biggest, one of the biggest beneficiaries is actually the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm, yeah. mm, mm. I saw that, I saw that. Okay, yeah. so maybe we, we zoom in on Buffett's um, investing stuff. So we talk about a lot about like Buffett as a value investor. Yeah. Okay, so for the uninitiated, right, what does value invest investing actually mean? And how okay. does it actually compare to other styles of investing? Okay, um, great question. Maybe I start off with a few things. Investing as a whole, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is like the term value investing was not actually created by Buffett. And it was actually created by this guy called Benjamin Graham. Uh, he, he was actually a British-born American economist. And he wrote two seminal pieces uh, that is one of it is coined uh, the, the book is coined securities analysis this was written in 1934 it's actually like a it's actually an mba textbook you know louis it's actually this thick <laughs> so if you actually print it I out did, yeah i actually bought i actually bought a copy of it but wow, I, think really? I cannot read yeah. it at all very think, very hard to read correct so can you imagine this is written in 1930s english okay it's very mathematical Okay, and it's meant to be a textbook. It's meant to be an MBA textbook. Okay, uh, then he wrote a simpler version of his thought process, and he the the, the term the, the title of the book is uh, intelligent investor. This was written in 1940, 40, yeah, I think 1949, correct. So, not to say it's 
thinner. It's still, uh, I think, three, four hundred pages uh, with uh, many, many editions today. Okay, and him and uh, uh, they they call it the super investors of uh, Graham and Dodd's villa, huh? right? So Graham and Dodd, they actually were the original value investor concept uh, inventors. Okay, Buffett was a student of Graham. Okay, and they actually kind of like modernize plus Charlie Munger modernize what value investing actually meant. So what is value investing? Value investing is understanding a business really well and buying it for a discounted number to the the real intrinsic value of a business. So let's just say today a company can generate. I, I'm oversimplifying here, but uh, I just want to get the people who are not into like deep into finance to understand the concept lah. this company can generate let's say company a can generate ten dollars in cash flow okay every year um but instead of buying it at ten dollars you are buying it at five dollars that means uh even though it can generate ten dollars in cash flow you are buying it suddenly one day the market crash you can actually buy it at five dollars so you already guarantee you kind of like guarantee you're getting ten dollars, ten dollars, ten dollars every 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 year, but you you're buying it for five. Now if the business grows to twenty dollars in cash flow every year, and you have bought it for five, you've already bought it at a much discounted level, right? That's how invest value investing actually works. Obviously, there are many other ways to invest. Um, some people look at charts. Uh, some people do what we call momentum investing, means they half understand the business and then they find a catalyst. Let's just say government uh, decides to lift uh, taxes on tobacco, meaning people will start smoking more. I'm just giving a hypothetical example, right? Then tobacco companies will benefit. Oh? Then people will rush. They, they hear a rumor and say, oh, yeah, it's going to be lifted. So they'll rush to buy tobacco companies. Oh? Uh, most recently, um, there was actually a flotation of sugar prices. Sugar used to be cap government control, and then the government actually lifted the cap on a certain grade of sugar. Because of that, uh, a, a particular sugar company in Malaysia actually shot up in price just overnight. You know, just oh, because of the yeah, yeah, yeah. So some people term this momentum investing or thematic investing. Okay, so there's a there's always a catalyst. Okay, uh, last but not least, there are people who do what we call quant investing. So quantitative. So what they do is they build very complex mathematical models, and then because of certain variation in the model, uh, it will be showing them buy or sell entries, uh, buy buy entry points or sell exit points. So obviously for the layman, um, we do not have that kind of computing power, super super computers to run all that. So it's more practical that most people do uh, either reading charts or momentum investing or value investing yeah i'm not saying that one is more superior than the other obviously i'll be biased because i'll say value investing has time and time again proven but they, they there'll be definitely a lot of brickbats to say hey i made money from momentum hey i made money from reading charts yeah do each his own <laughs> so like so like value investing would you say like there's a specific kind of investor for it there's a, a specific what sorry kind of investor oh yes yes um the kind of investors that value investing will attract will be people that um okay so i'm borrowing uh buffett's terms again uh, uh, analogies again people who like to watch paint dry on a wall okay so, so when you paint boring. You know, watch, watch the paint dry and hmm. people who love to watch grass grow hmm okay so, what, so when, like, when, I, when I make patient. this kind of analogies, what, what, what conjures up in your mind, uh, Louis? Um, something very boring. And very long. boring and being very patient. Yes, very patient, yeah. Yeah. So if you are into excitement, you want fast action, uh, value investing is very likely not for you. Mm. Because... So like, mm. if, 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 uh, how, I, I mean... Um, but would I still be able to make similar amounts of money with other investing methods? Um, so far, the best guy on record that has made like humongous returns, even better than Buffett, 
uh, is this guy called Jim Simons. Uh, he practices uh, quantitative methods. He runs a hedge fund. Uh, so we call it quant, quant investing for short, right? quantitative. He has more than 200 PhD scientists working on a model for him. Okay, that's one. Second thing is he has commodities, weather data dating back to the 1800s. He spent millions, even hundreds of millions of US dollars buying this data to feed into the model. And he has a whole set of supercomputers in his office running this model for him. So he's made like 69% compound year on year uh, for the past 20 over years. Uh, before fees are obviously his fees are very high he'll take off his fees but uh the point i'm trying to make is that your question how many who who has made much more money with a different investing style this guy is one of the ones that has a proven track record lah. yeah mm. uh jim simons the struggle is look at the amount of resources he needs to make that kind of returns 200 phd scientists supercomputers mathematical models and I think 69% is before the cost of all that, right? Uh, it's before the cost of all that and also because before even fees. That means right, if, he, right. if, he, if, he, if he minus off the fees, maybe about 30% because his fees are very high. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. So when, we, when you ask a question about uh, what, other value inve what other investing methods that uh, uh, you can practice, yeah, he's gotten 69, Jim Simons but he he took so much resource now the, the thing is mm. when you when you reflect back on a retail investor we don't have supercomputers we don't have 200 phd scientists at our disposal we probably only have um our eyes a pair of eyes and ears and our network of friends and a computer right so in actual sense value investing is very practical to the normal everyday person because unless you have all the other resources you know I, I, I'm pretty sure if you watch movies or some of your friends who are traders, right? They have like eight trading screens. Yeah. <laughs> a, whole, a whole room of trading screens. Yeah. But how about like IQ level? Like, do I need to be very smart to understand oh, how yes. value investing works? Uh, oh, no. Ironically, value investing is the opposite of being super smart. Mm. Because like, if you want to be quant, you want to practice quant, you want to practice trading, high frequency trading. That's where your IQ level needs to be very, very high because you look, you need to look at, consider multiple variables and data points simultaneously. But in value investing, um, so funny that you asked, uh, Louis, I just gave a talk to Petronas last week. And uh, the, the title of the talk was this, it's called uh, Financial Lessons or Investing Lessons from an 8 million janitor. Oh, okay. Interesting. There's this janitor in the US. Uh, before he died, nobody knew of his wealth. But when he died, he bequeathed uh, his entire wealth to his children, his stepchildren, and the, li the, school that, the school and the library that he actually went to. And if you looked at his portfolio when he died, when he passed on, when he donated it, he bought companies he understood. Companies like Coca-Cola, companies like the Bank of America and all that kind of thing. And in relation to your question, you'd be surprised that a lot of people think that buying the obvious idea is not a good idea. So in Malaysia, yeah. we'd be like, Maybank, the public banks, oh, it's oh, it's a boring business, it's way past its prime, all that kind of thing, right? So that's exactly what uh, Ronald Reed, this 8 million janitor, actually did. He actually bought obvious ideas. And you look at Buffett's portfolio, you look at his biggest 75 percent of his concentration which we'll talk about later as well is actually ideas that you and i know is them is like staring with you in the face it's just that people say oh why is it an obvious idea and you still buy it you know yeah, long, yeah long. i think people want to think that okay i have to do something extraordinary to make extraordinary amounts of money right correct and the second correct. thing is like so does it mean that we value investing patience matters more than smarts or intelligence you are spot on and the problem is sometimes they they may know how to buy you know louis but the problem with most people including myself is when to sell 
So what do I mean when to sell? It means, uh, are you patient enough to stay with your stock through thick and thin? That means, like, you know, you're a, let's say you are, a, um, I know this for a fact for football fans, right? Most people will tell you, oh, I'm a Man U fan or I'm a Liverpool fan or whatever. It's when they're winning. But are you willing correct, to correct. stick to your team? Like, you know, I know some people who uh, support this, this team called Queen's Park Rangers. I know you may not be a football fan, right? But so it's like, it's not a very well-known football team, right? Queen's Park Rangers. And the reason why I even named Queen's Park Rangers is because it used to be owned by Vincent Tan, Berjaya Group. That's really Vincent Tan. Uh, okay. okay, yeah. QPR. So um, how likely are you willing to stick with the business you bought through thick and thin? Like, i give you a classic example. Apple in 2014, 2016, 2018. This was the time when Steve Jobs passed away. Okay? So, when Steve Jobs passed away, a lot of investors says, oh, Apple will lose its spark because the genius behind Apple is gone. Okay? The original two co-founders, Steve Wozniak and, and Steve Jobs, you know, they're both gone, right? They're no longer day-to-day -day Apple. And they hired Tim Cook as the CEO, which is a very operational guy. He's not a creative guy. He's like a, he's like a military drill sergeant. You know? And then adding salt to the wound, uh, one of Apple's leading designers, Sir Johnny Ives, left as well. Okay, So that was a very low point for Apple. And yet, at that point of time, Buffett saw an opportunity because they started paying out dividends, all that kind of thing. And Tim Cook really knew how to manage the ship. So even though it was a great business, but people's perception that because Jobs left, Sir Johnny Ives left, there's no more creativity, Apple won't grow anymore. But contrary to popular belief, Apple grew even bigger and even more successful. So you see, right, the loyalist Apple fans who say, oh, after Jobs left, there's no more like creative stuff. But they don't look through the numbers well enough, dig through the numbers well enough. Hey, no, I'm not. I shouldn't just be looking at headlines. This guy is growing. This company is growing. It's paying, it started paying dividends, which it hasn't done in the past. And yeah, how, how well do you stick through it through thick and thin? Most people would have sold. I mean, you bought Apple, made tremendous returns. And then once Tim Cook came in, news is bad, wow, quickly sell. Right? Mm. But if you just stuck onto it, your returns would have been much, much, much more, you know. You know, that, that that's a great example I would like to showcase to you. Yeah, and I think in between they also like one of the most like successful products recently launched were their like airports. Yes. Mm, that that could have never come out from I think Steve Jobs would never do that. And I think yeah. like, different colors of like phones, different screen sizes. That would right. like I don't think that Steve Jobs would have liked that. Precisely. But yet it's happened proven to be quite good business. Correct. Um, so that's a very interesting take on, you know, how how uh, different kinds of like investing methods can result in different uh, outcomes. But some people say that, okay, um, maybe during uh, Warren Buffett's lifetime or era, he's 92 now, value investing was relevant. But now it's, it's becoming irrelevant. Hmm. What would you say to that? Okay. First thing is two things. Um, I still, I think, and I'm very sure of this, value investing will be relevant until the day I die. <laughs> so okay. it still has a very long runway. And uh, the second reason why I think it's still relevant is because a lot of his principles are timeless. Because you, meant, you, you remember I said earlier, who was the original, uh, the, the people who actually coined and, uh, and came out of this concept? Benjamin Graham okay, and David Dodd, right? And they were people living in the 1930s. So what was the principle of value investing? Buy a business that you understand very well and buy them at a discount. So going forward, what are the things, what are the new things that will happen? People will set up businesses, competing products, whatever, but it's still a business. And the business principles of you must be profitable, you must bring in cash flow, that's timeless. You see? No matter what new mathematical formula or some PhD guy comes out with some Nobel winning prize mathematical model, Buffett's or Benjamin Graham's principle still stands the test of time. 
it's just um, a lot of people try to murky, try to make it, uh, what do you call it, confusing, try to make it complicated. And that's why they say it's like, oh, it's irrelevant or whatever. But I, I strongly disagree with that because the most basic principles of investing is very similar to business. You want to make money, you want to make it profitable, and you want to make the business sustainable over the long period of time. In value investing is just really like finding those great businesses and buying them at a discount. So what is what will change in the future? Even if we go to space travel next time, Louis, I mean, let, let's just say one day we're a planet conquering race. We go to Mars, we go to Venus. People will still sell space travel as a transportation. People will sell food rations. People will sell entertainment. People will sell all this, right? It's still a it's still a capitalist enterprise, <laughs> you see. So, what will change? I I, I doubt. Like we're still human beings. It will still apply, la. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Unless ah, unless we all change our behavior. We don't need to eat food. We don't need to watch entertainment. We don't need to have a clean air supply. We don't need to have our rubbish collected anymore. We all turn into some kind of cyborg that you know lease off electricity <laughs> or something like that, right? Uh, then maybe value investing may hey, some not... kind of scary future that you've yeah. just described. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like Buffett has been proven time and time again that his method will, you know, during dot com bubble, before the dot com bubble, people say Buffett is old. Buffett doesn't understand technology, Hello? right? Dot com bubble came and gone. Okay. Then came uh, what uh, global financial crisis, 2008, banking subprime. He had to take over Solomon Brothers, had to clean it up, all that kind of thing. And he took over, he, he had like a preferential, if I'm not mistaken, was it JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley, right? One, one of the banks, he had a 10 million preferential shares, right? Time and time again, in every crisis, even the government of America, and they know that they, they don't have the appetite to actually take over a, a troubled corporation. Buffett is the guy to call. <laughs> you see, Buffett is the guy to call. You know, even the president of the U.S. Is like, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Buffett will come in and save the day because right now he's got like hundred what sixty billion in cash sitting there. Cash, yeah. cash, wow. cash. Yeah, yes. because if you understand Berkshire two main groups of the business one is an insurance business the other is is their uh, the non-insurance business the insurance business creates this huge amount of cash called float that they use to buy other businesses which i'll explain later uh, and it's like he has to be very he is very disciplined in how he splurges this cash any business that does not meet his criteria he wouldn't simply buy just to grow big the the, the purchase must make sense right yeah Mm -mm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, with all of these principles, he has grown Berkshire Hathaway from a very much almost failing to be closed company into today it's worth seven hundred billion. Yeah, yeah. Conglomerate with so many of the biggest companies in there, including Apple or Amex and and more like CCC's yeah. favorite candy shop. Yeah, all so right. maybe you can talk to us about like what actually is Berkshire Hathaway today obviously it's no longer a textile company nope what does it do um and how did Warren Buffett actually turn it into this company from a textile yeah. company yeah um he actually kept the name Berkshire Hathaway even though it was a failing textile company and they, they've completely sold off their textile like hive it off and, and, and close it down now. but actually way back in the 1960s i think 1962 to 1964 um he bought buffett actually had ownership of some shares and at that point of time he wanted to sell and the owner at that point of time uh this guy called uh seabury stanton he verbally agreed to buy back uh, buffett's shares for about 11 and a half cents Eleven dollars and half a uh, half per share, or eleven fifty lah. And a few weeks later, Buffett received a, a tender in writing, and the price that C Seabury Stanton actually offered him was lower than their handshake, which was uh, eleven and three eighths. Okay, I, I don't, you know, in the American system they don't like to use twenty cents, thirty cents. That's the metric system lah. But <laughs> eleven and three eighths lah, right? 
and it actually pissed off Buffett big time. Oh, <laughs> it's like you had an we had an agreement. It was eleven and a half, and this guy is trying to squeeze me. It's eleven and three eighths, you know, which is less than that of what was agreed, lah. And this caused Buffett to be e emotional, and he decided to to say, "Hey, you, you're doing this. I'm going to buy you out, and I'm going to fire you." And that's what he actually did. Wow. He bought out, yeah, he bought out the entire Berkshire Hathaway. Okay. And he got rid of, uh, he got rid of Steve, uh, Seabury Stanton. I fired him. Uh. So he got his, he got his uh, satisfaction because Seabury Stanton tried to like shortchange him and then he, he, uh, he got his revenge. But in 2010, I think, yeah, 2010, um, he admitted that buying Berkshire was one of his biggest investment mistakes ever he wrote in his letters oh. he shared it in his agm and he said that because he bought berkshire tried to save the textile business um he actually lost 200 billion in investment opportunities compounding return over 45 200 billion eh? so instead of the 700 billion that you talked about earlier the market cap right today if he had not bought berkshire it would have been a, almost a trillion dollar company uh, today. Uh, that's what he's trying to say. Uh. Yeah, right, and right. It kept the name Berkshire Hathaway to remind him of that lesson, Louis. He could have changed the name to like Buffett and Co or Buffett and Munger, whatever. He could have changed the name, right? He's the ultimate owner, right? But he kept Berkshire Hathaway, in my opinion, is to remind him of the lesson that he, <laughs> that he, he shouldn't have bought Berkshire out of rich. He bought Berkshire out of rage because someone tried to shortchange him and he already knew that the economics of textile was not good. That's why he was trying to he was trying to sell the shares back to Seabury Stanton. But you see, then it completely turned that he had to buy the whole thing back, you see. So yeah. maybe it was like a trick, eh? Yeah. You think? Could be. It right? Could it be, could yeah. be a trick, right? So they purposely make you angry, so you would buy something that's actually not worth as much, right? Correct, correct, correct. Mm. Yeah. So uh, you asked earlier about what is in Berkshire, right? Uh, Berkshire is, the, the term I would like to describe them is like a conglomerate. So the term conglomerate is like, uh, you know, you are, you are a big MNC, you own anything and everything. Lah. So the range of uh, businesses that Berkshire own, uh, they own insurance, uh, in, uh, namely Geico, General, General Ray, uh, Allegheny, which they just recently bought. Uh, they have utilities. An energy group. So you've got Midwestern, Occidental, Chevron. Uh, you even have re recreational vehicles. You know, like um, you know those big vans or lorries that you actually stay in at like a house. So they, they call it an RV. So he oh. recently bought, yeah, yeah. The one that you can like have a toilet, have a kitchen, have a bed, or that kind of thing. So he bought this RV company called Forest River. So it's 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 a many American thing. I don't see many Malaysians buying oh. things like that. Because we don't have that kind of roads, that kind of uh, camping sites to, to do all this. Um, he's also got clothing and footwear. Uh, you know Brooks? You know the shoes? Mm. Brooks, the running shoes? You know oh. like Essex, Adidas, there's oh. this brand called Brooks. Mm. Okay. Uh, he, he's actually owned by Berkshire Hathaway also. So okay. interesting. So like, like even before you name the whole list, it's already looking like a very, very broad yeah. range of companies without any specific niche or vertical, right? Focus. Correct. Correct. As long as the economics makes sense to him, he hmm. will buy it. Lah. So um there's this uh, another company. This one is uh I I visited the store, but it didn't appeal to me. Lah. It's actually an underwear company called uh fruit fruit of loom. So it's like, Ooh. yeah, it's an underwear, very comfortable. Okay, you can buy men's boxes, woman lingerie, all that kind of thing. Food of loom. Uh, what else that he has in retail uh, fashion? Uh? Ah, he has this uh, footwear company. It's not Bo, Bo Shimes. I can't remember what's the name of it. Bo Shimes is the jewelry company. There's one more food company, uh, uh, food, food apparel company besides Brooks. It, the name just, just left me. Uh, yeah. Uh, he also has building products. So companies like Benjamin Moore, MyTech. MyTech is a company that makes roof truss. You know, your housing roof. 
So like, if you don't want to have nails into your roof, this one is like the roof truss that is purely made out of wood timber. So he has companies like that. He's, he owns Acme, he owns Clayton Homes, okay. Uh, then he has companies that build flight simulators. <laughs> so you know aircraft, before you become a pilot, how you train as a pilot, you have to go into a flight simulator, okay. So he owns this uh, company called FSI International, uh, Flight Simulator International. So he owns flight simulators. He owns, okay, this model, uh, I, to be honest, I, 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 I love the model, uh, but I can't see the financial breakdown because it's a private company. It's called NetJets. Okay, so what is NetJets? So most rich people, they like to buy private jets. But the problem of private jets is like when you are not flying or not using it, you have to pay parking fees, you have to pay idle fees, you have to pay your pilots and all who are not flying and they're on standby, okay? So you're running, instead of just thinking about the cost of the plane, you actually have to pay a lot of maintenance costs year in, year out, okay? So what, <clears throat> what NetJets actually foresaw was this, hey, why don't a few guys share the private jet? Not a lot of people, maybe one jet to five people or four people. And we as the operator, NetJets, as the operator, we buy many, many jets. And our promise to you is that you can have an equal valid jet anywhere in the world in two hours, which is, I think, is a very fair proposition. So they came out with this concept called fractional ownership. So it's like, you know, you buy a, some people like to buy a summer house or vacation house. You only go there in the summer and then the rest of the year, you don't go there. So you actually get other people to share the burden of the cost with you. So mm. this is to jets. Huh? So let's say you and I, we are both NetJets fractional ownership. We'll get a NetJets card and we just have to make a reservation two hours before, which is actually, it's quite crazy. You know, you think about it, right? Yeah. It's two hours before you can have the, Eco-valent jet, let's say you bought the highest tier, which entitles you to a Gulfstream 550 or a Gulfstream 650, right? That jet will be available to you anywhere in the world in two hours. So good, eh? Is yeah. it expensive? Uh, obviously, it's expensive. Expensive. the cheaper oh, starts yeah. with, I think, 100,000 or 250,000, right? US oh. dollars, so it's a million. Mm. But it's much cheaper than owning the plane outright because for you to own, like, a, let's just say a Gulfstream 650 or a Gulfstream 700, right? The plane alone will cost you 70 to 80 million. And that's not including the running costs, you know, paying your pilots, yeah. paying and all that kind of thing. And then you have to, that, that, that plane, after a certain years, it depreciates in value. And then you got to do major maintenance, you got to overhaul the plane, all that kind of thing. It says, oh, that just says, I'll take care of all this for you. You just pay our membership, we'll handle everything for you. Mm, that's interesting and and i think i think it, it, it's also interesting how the economics of that actually makes sense you know yes precisely yeah, yeah. precisely so buffett you asked me just now what does buffett splurges on he used to have his own jet secondhand mm. jet he used to own his own jet and when he bought net jets now he's the like the ultimate share owner 100 right wholly owned now right? he just has a net jets car lah. Because it makes sense to him. He doesn't need the jet all the time, right? Only when he needs to travel, he'll call the jet on standby. And uh, yeah, and he has he has it for his kids. Because his kids, actually, there, there was one time when um, Susie passed on. So they need to bring the family all together and all that kind of thing. So they and they actually got a, a fleet of jets to bring the family in. Yeah, it's quite crazy, oh, oh, right? Very, very convenient. Very, convenient. very, very convenient. Just coordinating everyone in economy. Yes. The wow. sharing economy. Mm, correct, correct, yeah. <laughs> so this is like grab for private jets, are you think about it? <laughs> mm, for rich people, right? For rich people, yeah. yeah. So uh, continuing the kind of businesses he has, he has retail, he owns a furniture mall, Nebraska Furniture Mart, okay? He has um, Seas Candy, okay? He has Dairy Queen, okay? He have He's partial owner of this company called Kraft Heinz. You know Kraft, our cheese? Mm. Okay. And Heinz, the tomato sauce, the ketchup, uh, and also the chili sauce he owns. Okay. Uh, he owns Coca-Cola. Not, not outright, but a majority shareholder. Okay. Um, he owns media companies like the Buffalo Evening News, Business Wire. I don't know if you read articles from Business Wire before. 
Yeah. Not business times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Business yeah. Sometimes wise, yeah. Not, not very popular. Yeah. It's not, not very, very popular. popular. Yeah. It's a more market intelligence, data analysis mm, kind oh. of thing. Right? Yeah. So it's very. It's like for people who do research about markets. Yeah. That that's where you get. Okay. Uh, last but not least, he owns like what we call industrials. So what do I mean by industrials? Um, he owns this company called Precision Cast Parts. So Precision Cast Parts makes aircraft parts. You know all those very high precision aircraft parts. He owns that. Uh, he owns another drilling bits company. They makes precision tools and bits. Uh, Israeli metal company, Iskar. Okay. Uh, and most recently, he bought into what we call Japanese trading houses. So some of these names may be familiar to you. Uh, Mitsui. Maybe you heard of Mitsui. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sumitomo. Mitsubishi. We know Mitsubishi in Malaysia because of the cars, but mm -hmm. the other arm is actually a trading. They trade anything from metals, precious metals, commodities, or they, they even have a bank. Okay, Mitsubishi. Okay, and last but not least, Itochu. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the trading houses that just uh, Buffett just recently bought, lah. Yeah, because they control. I my guess. I haven't read very deep into it, but my guess is they control the trade of a lot of. Uh, Either raw materials in terms of commodities, and also processed goods, lah. You see, yeah. So it's interesting that when you look at Berkshire as a whole, you're like buying one country's economy. You know, mm. you've got furniture, you've got energy, you've got insurance, you've got building products, you've got yeah. So you know, like earlier, the earlier episode last week, we did robo advisory, and then we talked about ETF, right? And you buy the S and P five hundred. My argument would be this: If you're buying Berkshire, you're like buying the best of the S and P five hundred. Could could we just like look at what Buffett is buying and just buy his whole list? Yeah, you can, <laughs> you can, you can. Uh, but I I would say that here comes the difference. You have you and I. When I say you, meaning you and I and the audience have a better advantage compared to Buffett. We can actually just copy Buffett. You just go to what we call the thirteen F filings. So a thirteen F filing is actually a filing that the uh, hedge fund managers or fund manager is mandated to disclose every quarter. So that means mm -hmm. you and I we run a fund in the US, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And we're big. Every quarter you have to disclose what you bought and what you dispose, and it's in file in this thing called a thirteen F. Okay, so. A lot of people try to tailgate or what we call um what's this term? Uh coattail. Okay. The the correct term is coattail. That means they try to mimic Buffett's portfolio and they they watch the 13F filings like a hawk. Lah. So every time oh. the 13F filing comes out, right? Uh they, they watch it like a hawk. Lah. So oh Buffett disposed of this. So they dispose lah. like TSMC. Oh, he bought in one quarter, the other quarter he sold the whole thing because of geopolitical risk. Okay. So there's one way that you can mimic, but the struggle for Buffett is this. He has to buy a meaningful stake to be worth his time. And that's where we, that means you and I, we have an advantage because we can buy great businesses that does not need to be the size of Coca-Cola or Kraft Heinz like Buffett. Buffett cannot buy most Malaysian listed companies. And I'll tell you why. They're too small for him. Oh, okay. It's just 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 too too too, too small, because yeah, okay, I give you the economy already, right? Correct. Okay, so it's let's just say, uh, let let me give you some numbers, uh, then then you can paint the context better. In Malaysia, most public listed companies are in the range of three hundred to five hundred million market cap. Okay, three hundred five. Forget about the. KLCI top 30. Lah. KLCI top 30, you've got probably the big daddy is Maybank. Lah. Maybank is about 90 to 100 billion lah, market cap. Okay. Even 90 to 100 billion market cap, most of the time, the shares available on the public market to buy, in which Buffett will have to buy like the rest of us, is 25 to 30% float. That means available on the market to buy and sell, right? Out of 100 billion, you only have about 25 billion to 30 billion on sale at any one day. Okay. Now 25 to 30 billion, if you if you divide that in US dollars, you're talking about you divide by five lah, uh, you're talking about six billion US dollars. Six billion. Okay. 
Now, for Buffett to buy a six billion US dollars, uh, he his cash in hand is already hundred sixty, right? For him to buy a position of six billion, he has to do the digging to understand Maybank. He has to understand regulatory requirements. It's in a foreign currency, which is fine. He can he buy he buy even Japanese companies, but is it worth his time? That is he buying a great business that will grow in the future? That's a question mark, you know. So that's that's Maybank, the largest, biggest market cap in Malaysia. But if you talk about the normal Malaysian company, even though it's a great business, you talk about three to five hundred million, right? Twenty percent, twenty-five percent of let's say five hundred million, five hundred million, five five twenty-five. You talk about two hundred, uh, uh, twenty-five percent one quarter, right? So two hundred fifty million, nah. No, half of that, one hundred seventy-five million. Okay, one hundred seventy-five million. You divide that by five currency exchange. You're talking about only like. 35 million, 40 million US dollars. He hachu, uh, he already made that kind of money. Uh. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So, so, so it also has to make sense from like his time investment point of view, right? Like, correct, correct, mm. correct, correct. So that's why for Buffett, we may be able to mimic him. The struggle is he he plays in this category, the stratosphere category. We have an advantage, we can play the lower category and the universe is much wider. He has to buy companies like Kraft Heinz, multi-billion dollar deals because only then it makes sense for his time. You see, if a company is not making like a billion in sales, US dollars, I don't think it's even worth his time. Lah, you know, yeah, yeah. So we, we should also understand that whatever he's investing is what he can invest. So Correct. we shouldn't just like blindly look at the list, right? Because exactly. like, a lot of like people just like, oh, why don't we just, you know, copy him exactly and then like, we'll get the same returns, you know? No, you, 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 actually it's a great question, Louis, because remember I just told you about all these businesses, mm. a majority of them are private. You can't even buy them on the public market. So like NetJets, it's not even public. It's a private company. Seas Candy is a private company. Forest River is a private company. Okay, you've got Public lah, like the apples of this world, like uh, chevrons of this world, occidental, right? But a lot of the companies that Buffett buys, when you buy into Berkshire, right? The advantage is you're buying into what we call private entities that you can't even buy on the public market, which is a huge advantage. That's why when you when you mention that, uh, and, and and yes, a lot of people on the internet will say, yeah, just buy into whatever Buffett buys and you can kind of mimic his result. No, you can't. Because a big mm. part of it is private companies. So, so, so the strategy should, if, if they really want to mimic, they should just buy Berkshire Hathaway stock. Spot on. That's right. Just buy uh -huh. their. A lot of people say, oh, but Berkshire is so expensive. It's like 500. At the last well, I checked, I think it's 500,000 US dollars per share, right? I'm a shareholder of Berkshire. But because I bought the B shares, let me see. Berkshire Hathaway share price okay let's see how much it is okay it's close to 500 489,000 right <laughs> so in one day uh, just like yesterday closing it went up by 2,000 US dollars that's 0.43 percent <laughs> so okay imagine right one day movement uh, is 2,000 US dollars you know? <laughs> so who, who are these people buying Berkshire nowadays anyway Oh, uh, so you'll be surprised. Some hedge funds actually buy. They, they may not buy A. Some of them, they do. If the fund is very big, they can buy the A. Uh, but most of them will actually buy the B. The A shareholders are those guys that own the shares way back when Buffett started the partnership. Oh. Uh, when it was like a few hundred dollars. Yeah, and when he he, he listed the company. Yeah, those, those, those were the early... Most of Berkshire Hathaway's early investor. If not a multi-millionaire, is a billionaire already. So most of these guys, I, they're super happy shareholders. I, you know, when I went to the Berkshire Hathaway AGM, I met a lot of, I would say, more elderly folks mm -hmm. that have been there like seven years, eight years in a row, uh, or some of them maybe twenty. I've not met one with twenty years, uh, but I'm pretty sure they were. They're forty thousand people, Louis. <laughs> it's oh, quite wow. crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So normally you have lunch and then you have like sit around table, not sit around, stand around table. So that's where I started talking with some of these guys. There was one couple, 
I think they've been owners of Berkshire for about seven or eight years. And they are a bit worried is because they're going to likely inherit this to their children. <laughs> but their oh. children don't. Yeah, so it says, I'm hoping to bring my son here. That was what she shared with me. It was pretty interesting. Uh, pretty interesting. Yeah. What, what, okay, so like, okay, now, 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 you talk about the Berkshire Hathaway AGM. You went there about now almost three weeks ago, right? That you came That's back. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so I think I think for followers of Buffett, it's become some kind of like pilgrimage as well, right. right? It's not yes. the normal a company AGM. So what were some of the things that you expected and what were some things that you you went there and oh you know it was you found very surprising about attending this year's? Yeah. So they don't even coin it like an annual general meeting anymore. Actually, the AGM happens at 4 30, 5, 5 o'clock in the evening, which is the last, the, the, the end part, which mm. is like most people by them has, has already left already. The ones, uh, the, the morning session where people queue up to go, they call it a what was the exact term? I have to go look at it. If I'm not mistaken, they call it a uh uh wow crap. Sorry, the name just left me. It's either like a, a a gathering or a festival or something like that. They don't call it a meeting <laughs> because it's forty thousand people, right? So, yes. um, what were the things that uh, surprised me first? Uh, I think how friendly people are there because everyone is like minded, and everyone mm -hmm. knew that it's a very lonely journey as a value investor. So when you meet people there, they're very open to networking. They are very open to talking to you. And it's also American culture. Uh, I think that was what really, really surprised me. I heard about it, but until you experience it yourself, then you know. Second thing is, um, you'll be surprised how much respect Buffett gets. You know, The moment he walks in, it's a standing ovation. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that part is actually, you can't record. Buffett will tell you that it is... Um, before they start the AGM, before Buffett walks in, right? They will play a movie. And this movie is not live streamed because since 2017, I think they live streamed the whole AGM or the, the festival. But that part is never live streamed. Hmm. It's a very special movie. They create this movie once a year just for the AGM. Uh, it's a, we call it a skit. Lah. I think if you, if you understand what it's a skit, it's a very short uh, snippet of a movie. Very hilarious. And Buffett will come out with a video before that. It says, please, no one flim. And you can see like really 40,000 people, except for some, sometimes in the past, I, I, I've heard ignorant Chinese people still go in, like China, China people still go and record. But most of the time, majority of the time, people comply. And it's out of respect for Buffett, you know, out of respect for Buffett. People will get caught out, you're escorted out, the security, the security will escort you out immediately. Wow. You can, yeah, yeah, you're barred straight away. <laughs> so that's okay. why people respect, you know, all of us, we just like hit our phones and just like, just watch and enjoy it. So you can only enjoy it if you're there physically. So you cannot get this on the live stream. So that was what surprised me, right? And it's, I, I can tell you some bits of it. Uh, you have very famous actors that do it for free just to have fun with Buffett. So it's very funny mm -hmm. when you, you will laugh because it's a very hilarious skit. Every year is different. <laughs> Every year is different. Okay. Uh, the next thing that surprised me was how big the carnival is. So a lot of people mm. go and attend the AGM, but on the other side of the hall, they actually create a huge floor space uh, and all of Buff uh, Berkshire Hathaway's companies will be there. So you can actually sit in a private jet, a mock-up private jet. Mm -hmm. You can actually sit in a flight simulator, Flight Simulator International, it will be there. Uh, the people who buy C's Candy Louis is like, uh, in Chinese we say, Pyong Chen. Ah. And it's not cheap, you know. <laughs> the cheapest box I saw was probably eight ninety nine US dollars. Okay, and and people were buying them like like in like trolley bag fulls, you know. I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Like, did you my... buy any? Sorry. Did you did you buy any? Yeah, yeah. I myself I bought eighty three dollars worth of chocolate. So you multiply that, it's about four hundred ringgit. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, correct uh. Close to five hundred uh, Eighty three dollars. Uh, you just imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think it's also clever marketing by by Berkshire lah. because Seas Candy you cannot get it in Omaha. It's only on uh, California, the West Coast. So it's not 
across the board is not in available in new york if i'm not mistaken uh definitely not available in omaha so it's only once a year berkshire egm they bring it over they set up a booth and then they'll, they'll buy it out. It's, it's quite crazy um yeah those are the things that surprised me what did i expect and also what truly happened was the queue my god the queue uh you want to get great seats uh louis you have to wake up at three in the morning wow yeah, yeah uh, you, you know, seat. yeah to just, just get a good seat you wow. you want to get a normal seat can you can come at like eight seven eight i queued at five okay so we got okay not to say perfect but quite good seats okay um if you come later probably like nine you know later means about eight la, eight you probably get the very lousy seats uh, either behind the screen or like you know oh it's like a stadium uh. it's a stadium right uh. so um yeah uh sec second thing that like uh i would okay this was a surprise i missed this out you can actually ballot to ask a question to buffett directly oh so you go queue up at the question and answer booth mm -hmm. you put down your name they give you a, you give your identity card and then they will ballot they'll pull if you're lucky you get uh number one or two uh, then they will you will have a chance to ask a question directly to Buffett during the agent. Wow. Yeah. So, so did you did you manage to get one? I, I managed to get, but I was number five. Oh okay. so number five in eleven of eleven stations. So there's oh. a number five in station one, number five in station two. All those that got number three and above didn't manage to ask that question. Oh. Because each station um they only managed to ask two questions each. So there's already 22 questions and this is mm. you just imagine uh, from 9 in the morning until 4 30. uh yeah the buffet only managed to answer roughly about 20 over questions uh. yeah, yeah what were the questions about most most of the time okay uh you what can watch it in the live stream the seven hours but generally it ranges uh, this year the, que the quality of questions was fantastic uh. it ranges from things like de-dollarization it ranges from Buffett actually did put a caveat. Please do not ask us about specific companies, because it's either they are uh, looking into buying them or they already have them, and then he doesn't want to give a comment where it gives a negative remark or too positive remark that people just think of it or in, in, him inferring that you should go buy this company. So he he tries to avoid specific companies, okay? Uh, but he will talk about things like okay, how do you compensate managers that? are aligned how do you manage because berkshire is very well known for what we call decentralized approach so they have a very small corporate hq mm. five to mm. seven people and then they own such a variety of businesses right louis they let the managers run their own show oh, the only thing they need to report to them is probably a very simple p l and and probably problems that they'll call buffett it says most of the time he says my managers don't bother me because they are already very good people know how to manage the business very well right but when they call him and says hey is this an interesting business i want to buy it's uh, my competitor or something and they call buffett is because they want more money <laughs> oh. yeah 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 so th th that's that's one of some of the questions that buffett has asked a lot to do with uh china us china trade war how does buffett think about it uh they did ask about tsmc because buffett bought and sold and mm. in short uh, buffett's answer was geopolitical risk which he think he cannot predict um one interesting one was about uh, a lot of interesting questions about human psychology human behavior because in investing that's a very key thing human behavior okay uh he talked a lot about principles in his answers how do you behave around people how do you behave around businesses um he also elaborate the process of how he invests how he thinks and I think he did highlight one thing this year that I think he did repeat himself previous years or so. It's about how he enjoys seeing first generation Berkshire Hathaway shareholders bringing second generation and then bringing third generation. So that was very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that means I, I think those yeah. are things we don't really see in other AGMs, right? No way. <laughs> you know, like bringing whole family sounds, it sounds more like uh, going to the team park. Correct, 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 <laughs> correct. Maybe, I think in Malaysia, maybe Nestle, but mm. one, two generations, uh, second, first and second generation. Uh, 
I know some Nestle Malaysia shareholders, they buy Nestle for their children, uh, their grandchildren actually, as a gift. Grandchildren, wow. Yeah, as a gift lah. But uh, you don't see their, their grandchildren or children coming for the AGM. I've never, for me, I've never, I've, I've not seen, I've attended a few Nestle AGMs before, but I've not seen lah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was what I think made it worthwhile. Um, initially, I thought I would go once and not go again because it's, it's quite expensive, paying out of your own pocket. But now I can't, I'm, I'm kind of addicted, la, Louis, to be honest. I've been a shareholder since 2014. I never went. This is the first time I went, you know, 2014 till now. Uh, how many years is that? Six years plus three years. Uh, six plus three. Nine years. I've been a shareholder almost 10 years. Then the first time only I went this year, you know. So yeah, well, I think I think you should you should keep going given Buffett's age now. Yeah, exactly. Right? Before, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. 92. Exactly. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? Right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I I highly encourage that if you want to take investing, especially value investing seriously, just go and experience it. You remember I invited you, right, Louis? But I yeah, think it was yeah. a little bit of a last minute thing for you. And then yeah, you know, yeah. we had to arrange that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um so I think we 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 wrap up here. Yeah. So yeah. I think uh, we have gone through like what who is Warren Buffett. So for those who have never heard of him, I think a lot of young people maybe like someone yeah, in their 20s may exactly. not have heard of him in detail, right? But today, um, I hope that John's introduction gives you a little bit a sliver into who Warren Buffett is. Obviously, someone who has uh, been in the investing world for decades and decades, he's 92. It's too too little time in one episode to talk about everything about Buffett, but right. hopefully that gives you an idea about his basic backgrounds, his investing style, and what are the key ideas in value investing that maybe you can consider at ad ad adapting into your own investing journey. Correct. Yeah. I just have one last lesson to add on to your conclusion. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it, it's a it's a it's something of uh, numbers, uh, how, how much your investment would have grown if you had uh, mimicked his investing. Lah. So um, he started this year's letter with a story about Coca-Cola. And mm. I think this is, a, you know, I talked a lot about concepts and learnings within this episode, but I want the, the, the audience to actually like visualize the numbers, then you can really see how much is done. Lah. So he's bought Coca-Cola for 1.3 billion in 1994. So 1994 is like close to 30 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So at that point of time, the 1.3 billion worth of shares paid about 75 million worth in dividends. Okay. Mm. Today, Coca-Cola's share, equivalent that he bought 1.3 billion. Uh, today it's worth about 25 billion. So you're talking about almost a 20 times, 22 times multiple. Mm. And it pays out about 700 million in dividends a year. Oh. So 10 times, almost eight times, uh, eight times the amount of dividends it used to pay 30 years ago. So the lesson learned from this to conclude this episode is that when you think long term and the power, you actually realize the power of compound. When you think short term, you will never you buy and sell you, as you are as, mm. as you are a trader, right? You will never get to enjoy dividends because by True. dividends are usually paid once a quarter or once a year, most of the time once a year, right? You you trade in and out of the position maybe in a month, so you never get to enjoy the dividend. You never get to enjoy the growth of the company, right? But only with long term investing can you get dividends of that size. You know, can you imagine? Uh, you just buy, you just let the business do itself. I know. 1.3 billion. I don't have 1.3 billion, John. Yeah, but percentage is the same. Huh? You get what I mean? If it's like you buy one share, you get to enjoy the 100% growth as the guy who bought 1 million shares. It's the same. The percentage will be the same. <laughs> you see? So you bought one share of Coca-Cola, you may get, what, 75 cents in dividend. If you have bought it, if you just kept it, you 10 times your, your 8 or 8 times your, your dividends already in, in like 30 years. Huh? Yeah, yeah, well. so yeah, well. it's, it's crazy, you know. <laughs> it's crazy. Like when you when you told me about the letter and I read it, I was like, "Wow, that's amazing!" And if you if you calculate it from like 
the dividend and then like it's like two years worth of dividend worth the price that he paid for the company all right at the, at the start. so that that's kind of crazy and i don't think any other investing strategy offers these kind of chances or opportunities right yes 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 even jim mm. simon don't get to enjoy dividend because it's a trade it's, mm. it's, it's right, trading right. in and out yeah yeah so louis i think uh i i hope that you know um this video has brought some lessons to the audience and encouraged more people. Buffett is not old school. Uh, trust me, he is. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people say he's too old to understand technology. Uh, I think he knows a lot more. One day, one day we should look at the Reddit chats, John. Yeah. You will see. <laughs> <laughs> I think when people pass on comments too early, they don't realize how much Buffett actually reads. You know how, how, how much Buffett reads every day? You know? He, he oh, understands God. AI like nobody's business. You know, yeah, he may not be a technology purist, but he's at a very important juncture of understanding technology trends and understanding whether it's a viable business. So it's an intersection. Mm. And the reason why Buffett doesn't buy into tech companies is because, yes, it's not to say he disagrees with the tech, but can this tech actually make money? That's where he makes his decisions, you see. Yeah. So yeah, leave it over to you to do your final words again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh hopefully, like through this episode, you know a little bit more about Warren Buffett to ignite that passion or curiosity to discover more. There are a lot of videos in YouTube to learn about Buffett. There's also a very great book that I read when I was 20. It's called Snowball. Oh, okay, yeah. So if you want to know mm, a bit more about Buffett, it's a great start. It's I mean, although Warren Buffett is an investor, the Snowball book is, is a very good story to read. Yeah, right. there's a lot right. of stories inside which, you know, if you read it, then you understand, oh, this is this is how Warren Buffett thinks, you know, where it comes from. And uh, the book that John mentions um, from Benjamin Graham, The Intelligent Investor, is also a very good book. Not as um, in-depth as security analysis and not as scary to read. I also read it <laughs> yeah. about 10 years ago, and I think it was an easy read for... Uh, people who are just beginning, like, I think it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's not that. It's not very, very technical. Security yeah. analysis, no, like, I think you you can just stay away from that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't have a professor to guide you, maybe. Correct. Yeah, but Correct. I, I don't know if it's relevant. So uh, from there, hopefully, if you have any questions about Berkshire Hathaway or investing in general, you can leave them in the comment sections below. If you enjoyed this video, give it, this, give it a like. And if you want more content from us, make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thank you guys for your time watching this video and I'll see you guys. We'll see you guys again in our next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.